welcome. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Jim uh, Rowings. Jim is Vice President of Kiwit, a uh, very large and uh, uh, successful and uh, highly reputable uh, organization founded in Omaha, Nebraska 137 years ago. Um, I'm sitting here in Perth in Western Australia, the, uh, the Kiwit Australia headquarters, uh, and um, a good number of colleagues uh, have worked for the international group of Kiwit over the years, and I've been aware of its um, uh, huge reputation and uh, uh, performance, particularly in safety in the international resources industry um, over the years, and delighted to hand over to my colleague, Vice President Mark Hastak of the CIB, and also at Purdue uh, University to give the formal introduction and chair the next session with Dr. Jim Rowings. Jim, thank you for participating in this session. Thank you. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Keith. And uh, as all of you might know, that we have uh, three units on Purdue campus, construction engineering and management, civil engineering, and construction management technology that offer construction education and research here at Purdue. So on behalf of my colleagues from all three units, I want, want to welcome all of you to this session. And it is indeed my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jim Rowings, a Purdue graduate and a longtime supporter of all three construction-related programs here on campus. An industry leader and a scholar, Jim started his career in construction engineering as a boilermaker for CBI, or the Chicago Bridge and Iron Company, while working his way through school. Upon graduation with a BS degree from Purdue in 1975, he joined Aramco in Saudi Arabia as a construction engineer on projects ranging in scope from $60 million to $2.3 billion. He returned to Purdue in 1979 to complete his master's and PhD, and then started his academic career leading and developing the construction program at University of Kansas. And then he led the uh, construction engineering and management program at Iowa State University for 15 years as the professor in charge. As a teacher and academic researcher, Jim has developed new approaches to student learning and employee training. Needless to say, Jim was recruited to join Kiwit in 2001 because of his uh, expertise to work in the area of organizational development. Jim moved to Boston in 2004 to lead the organizational development activities for Mass Electric. He returned to Omaha and led the establishment of Kiwit University over a decade ago and currently oversees the technical development programs for the employees across five colleges, eight core schools, and several technical schools. As Jim makes his presentation, I would urge all of you to send in your questions through the chat room. At the end of his presentation, if you have time permitting, uh, between Don and I, we will field the questions that you have and uh, have, a, have a lively discussion. So with that said, please welcome Dr. Jim Royce. Jim, over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Mark. That was kind. Uh, um, I, I will. Um, I'll, I'm going to walk through a, a few items here today. I'd like to share a little bit. Um, I know a lot of you already, but I, I'd like to share a little bit of my insights I kind of gathered over the last uh, uh, 40 years of my career, and uh, I think as they relate to uh, uh, what I'd like to talk about here, I'd like to. Uh, um, talk a little bit about collaboration and, and my career was both in industry now and in uh, prior to going into academia and then back uh, uh, again and, and I've stayed very close to academia throughout my career whether I was uh, in industry or um, working at Iowa State. So what I'd like to do is is to talk a little bit about what I see as, as a challenge we all have. I, I, I think of that uh, that book that's out there, uh, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, uh, which describes kind of the, the differences in perspectives and cultures that uh, that the different sexes have. But it's probably true also of, of academia and industry to a certain extent. 
And um, so what I'd, I'd like to do is to share some of those insights and then talk about how I think uh, it's possible to break those down and, and actually be very successful in both ways. You know, there's these challenges that academia have, I think, when you look at the things that they see, uh, they, they need resources and they're under-resourced oftentimes by um, their, uh, whether it's a state uh, in the case of public schools or a private institution, just the resources available in a department to work with, uh, I think. They also uh, have some challenges of experience. They, they work with very young uh, professional faculty members. They're, they're highly talented, but they don't have a lot of experience to bring to the classroom uh, from industry, not as much as it maybe did uh, 30 or 40 years ago. I think sometimes um, academia has a tendency to lack of focus um, and knowing what they want. You know, they constantly trying to, I think, understand need. And um, they have, it's much like they have a hammer and they want to look at everything as a nail. But uh, the reality is they, they have to establish that focus and they jump from one thing to another sometimes just to, to try to find a niche. And, uh, and I'll talk about, I think, where those challenges come from and how industry might help with some of those. Academic schedules um, are a challenge because you're constantly starting and stopping and it's time driven, not necessarily, uh, you know, because of how semesters and academic calendars are set up that doesn't necessarily match with some project needs or project work that they might do or even a, a lot of the time when they could make the most and take the most advantage or times of the year when uh, weather's inclement or they um, uh, the students aren't on campus when a good opportunity to experience something might take place. And then just simply alignment. I think alignment between the various disciplines and departments and those, there's a lot of little silos that are set up in academia and in those worlds. And I won't say that it's not that way in industry, but I think less so because the purpose is around the organization and that's how it's, uh, uh, the, it, it is set up. So. Those are some of the challenges that academia has, but industry also uh, has some very big challenges as well as resources are a challenge for them as well. They often work with limited funds and you know they have to, to spend money at an institution uh, requires that they often bring in 20 times that amount in revenue to generate a dollar of discretionary spending uh, that they might uh, put to work in a university, either in research or in a in a way to help support scholars or scholarship in some way. I, I, I think industry also lacks experience a great deal with, with the research process, with uh, understanding how academics think to put curriculums together, even to the point of being unrealistic and how long it might take uh, or how much resources might be required to, to adequately solve a problem and to and, and to avoid bias and other things in the in the um, in the in the research process, um, industry by its very nature is very short-term thinking. And, and Kiwit is a very unique company in that we aren't looking for when needing a job tomorrow. Many companies do. Um, we work with uh, we're we're financially strong to the point where. Um, we don't look at quarterly earnings and those kinds of things that publicly traded companies have to simply because shareholder perception really describes the value of the company and, and, and determines the value of the company. So we're not as bad, but we still are short-term thinkers. We still need to get to something useful at the end of the rainbow that we're dreaming about. And so we have to look at year or maybe two year or three year horizons and that's our longer term thinking um, that you get from us. And that doesn't always fit with particularly basic research. It's very hard to justify basic research when you're in an industry where that might take 15 or 17 years to get into a useful um, uh, product out of it. And it might take several stages, risk stages of research to uh, align and to get together to work toward an eventual solution. So we tend to think of chunking things down in shorter term ways. 
Uh, we work on project timelines. We put a, a schedule out there and we expect deliverables on time from ourselves and others that work with us. So when we get involved in research projects, we identify a list of deliverables and success is measured not only by the quality of the product, but the timeliness of the delivery as well. And so that and getting alignment then with an institution becomes a very big challenge for industry to do that. Now, having described all those things, I think it's very well possible to work around those and, and, and to create some solutions. And so I'll, I'll share some experiences along the line, but I also want to first talk about maybe some opportunities that exist. I mean, I think for industry, there's an extreme value in working with academic institutions um, because we can achieve some things that we otherwise wouldn't have uh, access to the talent internally to do, nor could we do it for the same price. We pay people a lot of money and you pay graduate students very little, um, you know, and, and faculty are maybe in a sense of they are well paid, but not highly paid. And so we can gain a lot of value and we have access then to the talent um, as an opportunity there, but we also have our own talent that we can give access to a university as well. So it kind of goes both ways um, with that. But I think industry can provide some good strategic initiatives, some items that are big problems that can be chunked down and there'll be meaningful solutions. Uh, I think delivered if we align ourselves properly with uh, the academic community and, and research and in some other areas as well. It's not all research. There's some other areas where I think strategically we can align and, and, and both find value within. Um, I think we can gain a lot opportunity to understand learning principles. Um, universities are far more disciplined about that generally. And what I've tried to do at Keywood is to pattern ourselves after best practices of, uh, of uh, learning theory, adult learning theory, and, and, and things that I've learned through the years, starting back actually when I was a graduate student. I had an incredible course at Purdue in uh, um, the psychology of higher education that really shaped a lot of my thinking today. Um, understanding research processes as well. I, I think we all we all have needs to keep advancing and continuously improving and research is a, a mechanism or a tool or an accelerator to um, our continuous improvement and looking for breakthrough in area, new markets and areas as well. So there's a lot of opportunity for industry in, in creating a collaborative effort. And uh, I think also there's opportunities for academia in their the, the most obvious one is it's another source of funding. And uh, our money is still green, even if it isn't from the National Science Foundation or some other areas that are maybe in, in some of the scientific communities viewed as uh, uh, more prestigious sources of funding, but it still spends the same way. It supports graduate students and faculty time and equipment and all those things. And I think when we get behind something we can, when we see a value, we can also, we have competitors, but we work collectively together on some things. So that can also generate higher amounts of funding. I'll also tell you though, that the construction industry is dismally behind every other industry in uh, productivity. And the reason is because we don't fund research as an industry in the way that other industries do. And, and so we, we have a need to get better but universities can be our avenue to help find ways of where we're willing to spend that money. We'll spend it to universities for research before we're gonna openly give it to government to decide how much they're gonna put in probably uh, uh, other, other types of programs and or research. So I, I think uh, getting behind it, getting focused is a key there. I think we can provide, the other thing that probably isn't um, recognize as much as we can provide some real meaningful problems. It, it, it's incumbent upon universities and industry to align and to listen to each other a great deal to help define those meaningful problems because we might think it's one thing and with a little guidance and help and 
and conversation, we may get at where the root cause problem is, the area that if we could solve that, it would generate tremendous solutions for ourselves, individual companies, as well as overall for the industry. Um, I think academia has a necessity today to understand design and construction. In fact, I'm, I'm really one of those areas that I think um, is one of the greatest needs is, is to really understand the design processes that are followed today and construction processes. And particularly, and we're seeing that more and more is the integrated design and construction process. It is not training civil engineers to just design construction engineers or construction management folks just to build, but it's an understanding of both parts and bringing that together. And we start to think about how we're gonna build something as we are understanding what it is we're going to build and define that, that, that uh, alignment of those interests generates a solution space that's far more efficient than simply starting with someone's idea of a completed design and then trying to figure out how we're gonna build it the most efficient way. Uh, we've missed a whole bunch of solutions. And those of you that have seen that, that, uh, that curve that exists, it's, it's tremendously, it's exponential. Our ability to influence cost early on in a project in design stages, in definition stages, because we impact what the eventual construction costs are uh, that come out of a project that hasn't that that aha moment hasn't gone away. It's still there, and there's uh, still a tremendous opportunity within there. And then understanding the business and the economic drivers, understanding what really drives the investment decisions about projects, is so important for all of those involved in the supply chain in the early design stages and in the procurement stages and in the construction stages and the operation stages. But understanding what all those business and economic drivers are early on that drives projects is so important. For us, it's important as a company because we don't want to invest our time and waste our time on things that are never going to be built, right? But it also is important, I think, just to the outcomes and that, that clients need to have a, a solid business case, one that they can count on that is reduced all of the uncertainty possible or at least gotten a point where they understand the uncertainty and can manage and mitigate it as they go through the various stages. And so I think those, those elements are something that there's a lot of opportunity in is, is alignment with industry and academia to help understand that as a part of the education process. And also there's opportunities in the, in the research side, I think, to, to leverage that as well. So having said that, what I'm going to do is just, I'm, I'm going to just share a few elements and I'll just tell you where they came from. Uh, I've had academic experience. I got some of that at Purdue University and I'm forever grateful for the opportunities I had there and the things I learned there. I had a major professor that came from industry for my, uh, my doctorate degree. He'd been with Skidmore Owings and Merrill and, and he brought an understanding of how to listen and how to learn from others about the research problem. He introduced me to a fellow, maybe a few of you might have known him. He's been gone a long time, Dick Schaefer. He ran Searle. He started Searle, a construction engineering research lab for the Corps of Engineers. He was a longtime University of Illinois uh, um, professor over there and then went off and started that. And I learned so much about the research process um, from him. And I learned not only from my project that they funded at Searle, but also um, he introduced me to a number of other people uh, at Searle and and those were great and have been great contacts through the years uh, as they've gone on and most of them retired now, but uh, uh, they were good mentors. And so I saw that as, as a very important starting point uh, for me. Uh, I had a great opportunity timing wise. I started my academic career just as CII was getting started and somebody must have whispered my name in Dick Tuck, Richard Tucker's ear. And so I got an opportunity to get involved in a at the first CII meeting, from then on, I was on a task force and, 
involved in one of the early projects with um, Ted Kennedy from BE and K and Lynn Harris from uh, um, well, eventually became um, Brown and Root. Uh, CF Braun was the company I was with at the time. Got to meet the folks at DuPont that helped start CII. I mean, it was there was the classic Richard Tucker is still I. I put him up there as a pedestal of, a, of a, a gentleman that understood how to bring coalitions and collaborations together between industry and, and academia. And he did that the right way. He started with the clients, the owners, and could understand their business needs. And once he had, uh, had uh, listened enough to uh, uh, a fellow from Shell Oil and, and a fellow from uh, DuPont um, uh, in there, he he was able to pull together Stephen Bechtel and, and then that brought the rest of the leader companies in the construction industry together. So he, he married up academia, industry owners and industry contractors and design firms um, and to define problems, to work on problems and, and really make a major investment in research and, and and development in the construction industry, the greater construction industry. And um, um, so I learned a lot there and saw how he did that. And I think there's there's other models of that that have gone on, but that was a great opportunity uh, to have. I had supportive deans at the University of Kansas, Dean Lucas and uh, Dean Kraft, who made sure that I not only got out to meet people in uh, uh, the funding agencies like NSF, but also people in industry, and encouraged me to get an advisory council set up as we started up a fledging construction program there at the University of Kansas. Um, and that was my starter set, if you will. I, I kind of think of my grandkids and their trains and they start out with a starter set of Lego trains or whatever. And, and that was my starter set, try some of these things out. And it really helped me um, uh, learn how to put coalitions together, how to build groups of people, get them talking, and then listen and harvest ideas off of those, and then to take those ideas once you had them and uh, get get people to put some money behind them and fund them, and then spend some time involved in the research. And then that got them involved in the classroom as well. And so everybody benefited through that uh, that partnership. Uh, that gave me an opportunity to get up to Iowa State, and uh, uh, they took a chance on me up there. And, and again, another set of amazing industry folks that I met up there, uh, uh, advisory council that had been established uh, there already, um, three professors of charge ahead of me, including Tom Gellinger, who came from industry, was selected by industry, and started that great program there. And um, that continued on and, and continued on after I left there to, to, uh, to go into industry with uh, Chuck Jaron and Ed Yaselskis um, and, um, um, and Mark Federley and, and, uh, and now uh, Jennifer Shane. You know, great people that all have some industry experience and came in and, and we all, uh, that was kind of the motto there. Industry got behind research projects. They, they use their influence to uh, get money from the state legislature to fund research with us doing it at Iowa State. We had the DOT behind us, you know, just a number of partnerships that once those are established, we got to make sure we keep paying them forward and keep them going at institutions because uh, that collaboration is so valuable for undergraduate students, graduate students, and, and actually we're giving something back to the states that we if it's a public institution that we uh, we work for there as well. So all of those things entered into it. I had some uh, had some great industry opportunities to learn and collaborate. Um, I involved look, through my in, in, uh, in investment and interest in time. University of Kansas. Uh, I got involved with a small uh, construction consulting firm. Claims. Uh, some of you may have heard of Murray Holmes or. Uh, Wagner Holmes in Inglis and, and Mike Callahan, who's continued to be a great friend and mentor to me, and his father, Harry Callahan, who just happened to be an executive partner in Black and Beach. And that didn't help, that didn't hurt either of those connections through that um, to bring those ideas and scholarship and other things into, uh, uh, into use in the, in the programs. And the AGC, uh, both at the local level and national level, 
great to work with. They invested in research projects. They invested in students. They invested in various things uh, that uh, helped fund a number of graduate students and young faculty uh, through the years. And I think they're still investing. Uh, Nika, I know, is still investing in a lot of young faculty getting started in their research careers. That's the National Electrical Contractors Association. They have a, a research arm um, that um, Electric 21, I believe it's called, and, and very useful there. Along the way, I had a supportive dean at Iowa State, Dean Melsa. And Dean Melsa had, had been to uh, some opportunity in uh, Davenport, Iowa, and he spoke to, uh, it's the home of John Deere, a, a large uh, agricultural uh, and construction equipment uh, organization over there. He spoke to them and he talked about encouraging them to have um, faculty come and work their sabbaticals with, um, with their companies, like John Deere. And um, one of the people that happened to be in the audience when he was speaking was a, a Jim Estes of the Estes Company, and he heard it. And I had met him through some things in Iowa, and he took me aside and he said, you ever had a sabbatical? I said, well, no, I haven't. I've been thinking about going to the Czech Republic and a boondoggle and going over there and spending a year and pretending I'm writing a paper and having a vacation. And, um, and he said, well, well, Jim, he said, maybe you want to do something useful with your time. What if I hired you and you took your sabbatical and you work for us? And uh, I said, well, what do I do? He said, well, I haven't figured that out yet, but if I'm paying you, I'm going to figure out something useful for you to do. And, and that led to um, half of my job there was to develop their internal university, if you will, training program, development program for their engineer superintendents and the executives coaching. And the other part was method improvements to their operations and going out and studying their operations and looking for ways that uh, they could maybe leverage knowledge that was out there either in the industry or other places and bring it in. So I think it benefited them because they were very pleased uh, as I took my year, I worked over there and, and I got an awful lot out of that that I brought back to the classroom. And, um, and I also built a lot of relationships with a whole larger group of industry folks that they worked with on their projects, including John Deere and some others. So uh, that became a very useful mechanism, but I also got a lot of uh, coaching and mentoring from Jim Estes. He was uh, he was not college educated, but he valued education. And um, he wanted to make sure that he had, he, he, he had a saying, there was a recession back in the early nineties and he said he chose not to participate in it. And he had several sayings like that, that I used when I went, we went through the pandemic this last year with Kiwit. And I said, you know, we just gotta choose not to participate in this slowdown, not to let things, keep us from taking risks and continuing on and continuing training, continuing development of people, all of those things. And it's, it served us well in Kiwit. It, uh, I give credit. I heard Mitch Daniels say some things. He's the uh, president of Purdue University. Had a very similar uh, comment, maybe a little more grandiose than Jim would have made, but he said the astronauts probably would have never gone to the moon if they hadn't been willing to take chances, right? So this last year was Purdue doing more at the pandemic time than most other institutions, certainly those in the, um, so those comparable universities in the Big Ten that were shutting down and not having class and, uh, you know, doing all kinds of things to convince themselves that uh, they couldn't do it rather than figuring out how they could do it. So learned a lot through that experience with the Estes company and and then I, and my experience with Kiwit, and Kiwit's a great company and, and willing to invest where there is time. And so we now are now at a point where we're now able to go the other direction. And I think I'm, I have some influence to, to go make some investments and create some collaborations with universities. And so I'll share with you a, a little bit here, um, maybe thinking about where we might go with some of these things and some of the best practices that I've picked up along the way, um, class facilitation, you know, learning how in, in their industry, how we can do things like they're doing in universities now with the guide on the side rather than the sage on the, sage on the stage, the, 
you know, this, uh, this idea that I had when I went through school was the smartest person was the person in front of the room and you just listened, took notes and they do everything. And realizing now that students can learn from each other, they have experiences and, and they can gain insight from even their summer experiences. And so how do you activate that? How do you facilitate a class? How do you create a, a case study and a problem and those kind of things that can really elevate the learning level, the critical thinking going on in a classroom, not just memorization of how to count bricks and, and uh, calculate uh, stresses, but they can actually think through big problems that are out there. Uh, the advising and mentoring. And, and you know, industry people can come in and they can provide a lot of insight of alternative career paths. You don't want somebody just to come in and say, you gotta go to work for our company. You wanna come in and have people come in that can say, hey, I did this for a while, I did this for a while, I did that for a while, I got this from this experience, I got this other thing from the other experience. That's really helps students gain an insight as to what they might get and where they might go and what are some of the possibilities, not just the traditional civil engineering degree, but all the different things they might do with that. And what are some of the skill sets they're gonna need that somebody wishes they had today, maybe it's data analytics. You know, we had statistics when I went to school and that was a real basic set, but today it's much higher level data analytics that are probably required for our engineers, whether it be construction or civil. You know, recognition of preparedness, what does preparedness look like? What do you need to really be able to deliver? Um, and, and what are the insights about, what are some ways that you can fail? so that you avoid those situations. You anticipate when you might get put in a situation and you avoid having to react at that point. So all of that recognition of preparedness stuff, that can come in the undergraduate level from some mentoring, some insights, some sharing of the right stories, sharing of, of, of things that people have learned at the right time in somebody's preparation. The whole experiential learning is a huge, opportunity, I think, in undergraduate education that we don't take enough of. It's to go out summer, work and do something, come back to class, take these things. We don't tie the two together in some way and, and tie the summer experiences with what might happen in the classroom. And again, these partnerships with certain companies can really help along those lines. The aerospace industry does a lot better job of that than we do in the construction industry. And I've seen that in some of the things they're doing. I believe the medical industry does a much better job of that than we do in defining some of those experiential learning experiences in a, in a more prescribed way. Brian Hubbard's on this call. Brian knows what I'm talking about because the internship in the CEM program at Purdue does that. They define those types of experiences. That, that's a long way toward that is giving industry some help with um, whether it's making sure they got estimating and they got office engineering and they got field engineering experiences. Uh, I think they can help with people involved in the accreditation process. I'm a part of that now in realizing how few industry people get in and, and get enough understanding of what you all have as uh, constraints in your programs um, to help guide that process, and to help reinforce it when you you have an advice something like that have a couple of members that are also involved in accreditation of other programs bring good ideas back to your programs but also make sure that they can explain to other members of the advisory council what and why some of those requirements are related to the minimums for accreditation uh, I also think then the programming and financial support can be tremendously helpful as you try to move toward higher representation of women in your programs, which you all mostly need to do, underrepresented minorities, which we all and the industry needs to get better at, uh, as well as funding for some practical experiences and some of the equipment needs and those kind of things for labs. I mean, there's all kinds of programming and financial support where industry can help out with the undergraduate program. So those are all some opportunities. Um, a couple more things I might mention here, graduate programs. I mean, I think all of you are active in graduate programs. Some of the same things go. I think uh, getting people in industry to help um, guide some of your students on advanced and contemporary topics 
and provide some real world challenges that they can sink their teeth into and work with because I think many of them are looking for that as much as gaining their research skills to eventually get a PhD. They're looking to really advance their, uh, their level and complexity of problems that they can solve. Obviously, class facilitation advising is all the same as undergraduate. Helping with case studies, uh, we've paid to have case studies developed. Mike Borster developed one for us. And we use it, but many we give it to universities to use. It's nothing magic. Uh, it's really it takes a lot of effort to build some of those complex case studies uh, and simulations. But universities, it can be a funding mechanism for a graduate student to help do it, as well as a value to industry to use those as they train their advanced and advance their managers. And then all kinds of special special problem topics and discussions, and then research support, finding a problem that we have, that we need a solution for, and you can provide your expertise and you can provide some resources to do some of that testing and, and, and development um, along the way. So all of those are opportunities at the graduate level and, and outreach and service, I think in terms of like a land grant school. So online programs, testing inspection services, consulting. I know, Mark, you've had a program there at Purdue for consulting services and some of that that you worked out with the college, I think. And, and that, obviously, cooperative service to the professions, whether it's a road school like they have at Purdue or many of the others have those similar things, and then community service. So lots of opportunities for collaboration. There's no shortage there. It's imagination that's in shortfall. So a real simple thing, um, and, and it's simple to say these five points here, but they're the important part of creating a collaborative development process. You need to have cultural alignment. You need to understand the industry you're working with. Is it a low bid commodity type contractor or firm? Is it a design firm that sells man hours? And so they have limited fees that are left over. Is it a full service uh, self-performed contractor that takes bigger risks and, and, uh, and may have bigger rewards or, or more discretionary funds when they're, if they're continually successful to invest. Um, but they've got people and they've got people that understand what universities are about and appreciate what they got in a degree there. Maybe they appreciate the local market conditions because they're from that area. That's all cultural alignment and it flows right into the success with people. You have to build relationships with people, get to know them, listen to them. Don't, um, the fellow I met at uh, uh, Southern California school, it took him 19 seconds to get to asking for money. He didn't even know my name. He knew I was from Kiwit. And uh, I always remember that, that he still holds a record. That's, uh, um, uh, well, I won't say, but it's, uh, it's we, don't, we don't do much with the school. In fact, I just noticed we're not even recruiting there this year. Um, but, you know, it was one of those things that they just don't understand. They didn't get it. And, um, uh, but it, it's how you develop those relationships with people and that goes on. Um, the listening skills are extremely important. And that's part of building the relationship is to learn to ask questions and listen to the answers and actively listen to them and, and delve into a little bit more of understanding before you try to be understood. Um, that's just a communication technique, but it's so important for graduate students to learn that as they go out and they take on these projects. The CII was so good because they did that for so many graduate students that were out meeting with people in companies, learning how to listen and learning how to um, um, dig into problems and get to another, a little deeper layer. And then that built relationships for them and for their universities with those companies that they were interacting with. And, and I know there's a lot of folks here probably on the call that have had multiple projects with CII and that's kind of the secret to continued success there is to know how to go in and interact and get your graduate students to develop those skills because they want their graduate students, they want, they want to have graduate students out doing those projects too and not all faculty going and doing the visits. So uh, I think that's extremely important. The, the next two down here are two important ones for industry. Focus equals power. I always say that whenever you can focus on a problem, focus attention on one thing and, and get it 
smaller and finer, it delivers an enormous amount of power. It's very efficient. So think about your areas where you have some expertise and really focusing on those. You have to go out and listen for problems, but don't try to solve everybody's problem. Look for the ones that fit where you have the expertise and you have the knowledge and you can focus some attention. Where you have a graduate student that's really passionate about something, you can get them aligned into something. That, that will be your, your highest value uh, investment of your key resource, which is your time and, and your graduate students if you're getting involved with research. It's also true when you get to, if you have great educational programs and you have a great online delivery system, that you can really focus and you can have a lot of power in delivering online education to industry. And you can see how some have done that and done that very effectively. Um, so think about where those, those focus areas are and pick out one or two of those and work on those. And then the last one down there is from the industry side is thinking about always your client. How are you gonna create value for your client? It's not just supporting yourself or your graduate students, but it's about What's that going to help the client be able to do? What are they going to do better as a result of that? Are they going to get access to great undergraduates by coming in and lecturing in your class? It doesn't have to always be a research project. There could be lots of ways where you can influence people to do what you want them to do because they want to do it when you can show them the value in making that investment of their time or their money in something, whether it's an advisory council whether it was Richard Tucker figuring out that if he got owners around the table to talk about problems, the contractors would come because they wanted an opportunity to spend more time with owners who were gonna buy their services. Or the faculty would come because they wanted an opportunity to be next to the contractors and the owners and have a chance to get some funded research. I mean. That's how everybody goes about life is creating value for somebody else. And so um, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think it's just a matter of recognizing it from the beginning and making sure that that's where you end up in, in, in what, you, what you go out to promote. There's been some great success stories. I've talked about the University of Texas and I, I just admire what they've done. I admire what, um, folks did down at Arizona State University with the Dell Webb School uh, when that started with Vern Hastings and then Bill Badger and now another triumphant of folks down there uh, Gibson Ed Gibson and and um, um, the various folks that are down there they figured out how to put coalitions together and get their Stanford in the early days with Ray Levitt and uh, Boyd Paulson and uh, Bob Tatum and that whole group, and now Fisher with the uh, SIFI and some of the things they've put together. And there are others, I, I, I started on this list, I had like 10 of them and I got to stop with three, but there's good university success stories. I think the University of Hong Kong has a similar success story internationally. And I think there's some schools and I apologize, I don't know as much about in Australia, but I think there's some schools that have been very successful down there and in Canada, um, up in University of Alberta, they've done this. And there's just a lot of these university success stories. Go and learn what you can from them. I went down and spent time with Vern Hastings and Bill Badger. I stole their ideas shamelessly and brought them back to Iowa State. I did the same at Texas and learned what they were doing at Stanford. Could never quite pull that one off. But, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of things you can learn from these various programs and, and go around and talk to folks and make the most of your networking when you have it to learn from each other in these, uh, in these avenues. Kiewit, we've had a good way. We've gone the other way now. We've, we've started collaborating. We recognize the importance of our partnerships. We started a program a few years ago, Building Stronger Curricula with Kiewit. Uh, that's how we branded it, BSCK. We invite faculty. This is kind of like we used to take faculty on field trips. Well, this is a field trip, but then we use our training materials and we give them away to the universities to take and use. And we've got a a site set up on, I think it's yellow or something like that, where you can go, you put stuff in, we ask the universities to put some of their best programs in and they're shared. And uh, these are teaching programs, teaching how, how scheduling, blue beam, whatever it is, all these different topics are in there. 
and then we put our own in there as well and everybody has access to them it's uh you know, I always say in our industry, the source of competitive advantage is execution, not uh, ideas. There's a lot of people with ideas. So it's a good, I think it's a good program. And, and it's been a great way to get faculty to talk to each other in the summer. We'd have a couple day program and, and do it. We did it virtually last year, you know, even during the pandemic. And, and I think uh, then we give them a job tour or some amazing job that we've been working on or something. And so that's another thing. Uh, University of Colorado, we've, we've started a partnership with Kiewit Scholars program out there, and we started that last year during the pandemic. And again, my attitude I learned from Jim Estes, we're not going to let a little pandemic get in the way of something we started with Keith Molnar. It started over, a, honestly, it was a place map he laid down in front of me at a dinner in the spring of 2020 before the pandemic hit. And we went through and we, he had a good plan laid out. We sat down and we were doing all kinds of things. We have 40 scholars there. Uh, first year is done. We did mentoring. We've got classroom. We did field trips. We, um, we did some online uh, virtual tour of our innovation center. Uh, we did some crazy things the first year. This next year, we're going to put it on steroids and really up it. We've got 40 new scholars up there. And we're gonna keep it going. And, and we like that program so well. We're also doing one at University of Nebraska, which is we got more executives that graduated from there. So that wasn't hard. The relationships were already there. It was a matter of University of Nebraska figuring out how they could move fast enough. And, um, and we got that. We got a couple others that uh, we're working on similar. Actually, we got four others that we're working on similar to that. And, and again, we're, we're aligning whether it's you know, every Colorado, they've got a great safety center there, uh, kind of spun off from Mark, Matt Hollywell used to do a bunch of things for CII and he kind of started his own center. And boy, they got great, great talent and uh, they're set up right for success there. And so you, you start to see different multiple things happening. We got research going out there, various things. And, and I think those are models. Um, and uh, they're good for us. We've seen good things come back to us, which means we want to invest more when we see that come back, and 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 we'll tell our friends about it, our and our competitors the same way. You know, go look at those things. You got to get they got to get their heads wrapped around it. They got to have friends in universities that they want to work with, but they'll do the same thing. I think you just have to to reach across. So I've talked longer than I needed to there, um, but I I would like to um, uh, kind of wrap up and see if you've got any some discussion, some feedback. I always respect what you guys tell me and I'll take some notes. And, uh, and if you got any questions, glad to answer. Jim, thank you very much. That was indeed a very thought provoking presentation. And uh, as everybody is uh, writing in their questions, you know, please uh, use the chat room and uh, drop in any questions that you have. And between Don and I, you know, we'll, we'll field the questions. So as the questions are coming in, let me let me jump in and ask my first question, Jim. And that is that, uh, uh, you know, how do you see that academia or academics can become an integral part of a project team, perhaps to uh, bring knowledge about innovative techniques uh, to learn best practices from, from that engagement, uh, to find opportunities for innovation and then uh, which, which perhaps could lead to continuous improvement. So your thoughts, please. Well, I think you have to, you have to be out there and you have to be presenting papers and, and being networking at events that industry is at uh, to get to be known. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use, I'm gonna use, um, Keith Molnar as an example because he's a he's currently he's um, we we got to know him because we saw what he was doing with alternative delivery systems and that was a that's that's kind of our niche it was a, it was an emphasis in our area we wanted to know what some of the best practices were out there and so I think he was involved with the Panama Canal I mean we kind of saw him presenting and being a part of things and identified that and we've got. Um, and we've got a unique project with uh, some unique risks associated with it that we're doing for a uh, department of energy. Uh, I've forgotten what the name of this thing is exactly, but they, 
they star it up and they fire these tiny particles from a place in underground in Chicago. And we built a, if you will, a catcher's mitt for them, a big, huge underground cavern tunnel thing up in South Dakota, you know, Department of Energy. And so it's, it's a microparticle stuff. Well, you know, it's kind of unique stuff. And so we wanted somebody that, that wasn't, we're not an expert in that stuff. I mean, they've got all the experts in that stuff. We need somebody to help us think outside the box on risks and some of those things. And so he came to mind, you know, because we knew him from the, the alternative delivery stuff, it kind of carried over. And so that's typically how people get to be known or you're at an ASCE conference and you're you're presenting something in a technical nature and our guys are sitting in the room and we, we send folks all the time to those. You know, and so they you you kind of get to know them that way. And we've met some folks out in Southern California. We're doing an interstate project on LIDAR out there at USC. Very useful for us. And so, yeah, you just, it, you know, some companies don't go out and look for it or they don't have somebody, which means you got to work at putting what you're doing out in front of people so they kind of know. And, and then they will come to you and they figure out that what you do is something they need. You know, it won't be that they have a need because you tell them about something. They won't, it won't work that way. They'll have the need and then try to figure out who can help them with their need. Uh, Jim uh, is Don Ward. I had a question came in from Hisham El Khadi, professor at Salford University. He's on the uh, Salford University in the UK. He's on, he's a board member of uh, CIB. Um, talking about pushing the move from university industry collaboration to government university industry. How do you see the role of of government agencies in innovation in the sector? Um, do they have a role to set an innovation context for the collaboration between universities and industry, for example? Yeah, I think governments are in a much better place to look longer term. So they should be funding research, more basic research, probably that that would be the starting point. That's why NSF exists in the United States is they can go and they can fund good research that there isn't a problem that there isn't a necessary a problem for now they're getting a little smarter you know our governments are saying hey we'd like to see something at the end of this but they're much more inclined to accept that you're not going to have the final solution in three years or even six years that it's going to take longer to get to product line or those kind of things so i think that's one avenue the other one is kind of critical, urgent needs. And then, you know, you might find them funding something. Let's just say there was a, there was a horrible, there's been a horrible building collapse here in the United States. And as they go into that and they start to understand what the triggering events are, it could well be that in there is something that needs some research to change the building codes in a very short time period they might fund that. That's where a government might get behind it and it might need it might need a gazillion dollars, right? It might be $350 million they need to put in to get enough research in all of the areas to solve that kind of problem. They would be a source that would do that. That would be a source of it. My PhD project, quite frankly, you're gonna to laugh today, but there was a energy crisis in the late 70s and the price of uh, petroleum fuels spiked. It went way up. And so the Corps of Engineers had claims on all of these dam projects and earth moving projects, you know, all that kind of stuff, because they had they were obliged to pay um, an escalation amount for fuel. And so they needed to know how much was a reasonable amount of fuel for various construction operations. So they funded my research to go out and create a model for embedded energy, if you will. And, you know, my major professor and Dick Schaefer were smart enough and visionary enough. They said, you really ought to look at this and put it into embedded energy in terms of like BTUs or something like that, rather than just dollars, so that it would be scalable in the future. Well, it became, you know, it, was, it solved their problem. It gave them a basis to agree to pay certain amounts of money to earth moving contractors on a reasonable basis for, uh, you know, their uh, their use of their construction equipment. I kind of extended it beyond that because I needed to, to the embedded energy that came out of the foundries that they used to create the, 
uh, castings for the tractors and the dozers and all those kind of things. And uh, so, you know, we answered the question. I got a paper out of it. The problem went away. And then in about mid 90s, people started calling me because of this thing of uh, uh, carbon, um, embedded carbon. You know, and everybody wants to be zero carbon footprints. And guess what? It's the same kind of modeling. It's just a little more, it's a lot more sophisticated than I did the modeling, but it was a starting point. So yeah, that was that was driven by a need that, industry, that the government had at that time for something because they are obligated to pay and they wanted to pay a fair amount. And they did research to get at that. And in the process, they helped out a, a graduate student and a, and a university professor and, and furthered some things along that they could use again a few times. Jim, there's a, Jim, a question. Don't go, get that, don't go get that dissertation. I'm not real proud of that today. That's pretty, it's kind of like Boyd Paulson told me when he, he's passed away now, but he said to me one time, I looked at his dissertation, I said, so you basically came up with the idea of using computers in construction. He goes, yeah. He says, I got some graphics and stuff in there. He said, yeah, I'm not real. He says, looking back on it now, it doesn't seem like much. And I go, yeah, that's the way all, he said, that's the way all PhDs are. Don't worry about it, Jim. Yours will be that way someday too. Uh, Jeff, uh, a question came in from Keith Hampson. He's sure. uh, asking that, how can young faculty balance the key challenges between teaching, research, and publishing while developing industry linkages? Well, uh, you know, what I would say there is, if you can figure out a way to get these all aligned, so that as you go and you are, particularly if you're interacting with industry, if you can figure out a way to, when you're going and you get involved in an industry project with uh, folks on an advisory group or something like that, for like I did in NECA or some of those kind of things, AGC, bring them into the classroom. Get them to tie into your university so it helps you in your teaching. It helps you, you know, you can get problems that you can use in class from the industry people. You kind of tie it all together. You get it working together, you know, kind of everything moving together in the same area. It can really be useful that way. And it, and that's also makes your time more efficient because you're, and when I got near the end of my career as I was moving out to go to Kiwit and I look back on my time at Iowa State, so many things were intertangled of some of the service things, you know, helping out the local AGC at a conference or something like that, a research project I had, that might be what I was talking about there. I might take some students along and they get involved and they get paid to help prepare stuff. I mean, it was all kind of aligning. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is learn how to delegate effectively and figure out what's important and what's not important. Um, you can easily spend your time, a lot of time on things that aren't, aren't furthering you. I, I got a lot of advice. I was mentored by a fellow by the name of Randy Thomas at Penn State. And, you know, he kind of, you know, so we were sitting there, we put a proposal together, and he looked at my resume and he goes, okay, Jim says, so this stuff ought to be on the front page. This other stuff isn't very important. And I realized that there was a whole bunch of stuff I was doing, service stuff in the university and things like that. It, were, it wasn't important to get in a research project. It really wasn't important for raises in the university when you got down to it. And it didn't help. I didn't wasn't spend a lot of time with students. It wasn't helping the students a whole lot either. It was just something. So I figured out, okay, I got to figure out what's the minimal amount of that stuff I got to do. You know, and, and when can I miss a faculty meeting? <laughs> Ma Ma I, I got some department heads. I'm looking down here. I see some department heads or former department heads. I probably don't like that statement, but. but perhaps I could just build with, maybe this is the final question, but uh, Mike Beam, program director, said to, uh, asked me, just building on this theme of uh, students, so, to what extent have you had any experience of international uh, collaborations, such as student exchanges or faculty exchanges or any summer study abroad and, you know, do, or, or any insight into what the benefits of that sort of international experience would be for industry? Well, interestingly enough, we are, uh, we're, we're funding that as part of our Kiwit Scholars programs because we think it's important for the students to have some exposure internationally. And, and you know, I appreciate the comment from the gentleman there from Perth. I mean, we, 
we did Project Perth. We had Project Office, uh, an office over there, Australian office was in Perth. And, and right now we don't have an active project over there. You know, you never know when those things are going to come along. We go there because of clients. You know, we don't we don't go to disrupt markets internationally. The international contractors come here to the U.S. So, but our students need that international experience. Um, when I was at Iowa State, we had an exchange program. It started just with the Velvet Revolution in the Czech Republic. Uh, made some great friends over there. Uh, they came over faculty exchange. I went over there. They came over to Iowa State. Graduate students came over um, to our place. We had a couple students that went over there. It was more difficult sending students over there because the language of instruction uh, was in Czech and it, so it was more difficult for them to get credits. Uh, over there took a, a ind independent study with a faculty over there to get credits, but those are all possibilities, and, and I encourage uh, that for a semester or a summer. Um, there are two kinds of international experiences. Um, you saw my background. I worked uh, in the Middle East back in the 70s. I'm a big believer in that, that everyone needs some exposure to developing countries. That's one kind of international experience, and that can be gained with Bridges to Prosperity, Engineers Without Borders here in the U.S., some kind of a service project of two weeks to four weeks. You can go get and you get an in, you get insight that way. The other kind of experience is immersion into a semester long program. And I believe those are beneficial because you will get a entirely different perspective about education, a real deeper understanding of um, how we are similar and how we're different as peoples because of where we live and, and the influences of history on us, whether it be in Australia or in England or in Germany or in Chile or other places. And I, I think those are another kind of experience. I mean, my idea would be a, an undergraduate would get one of each. You know, they'd have a semester abroad somewhere and then they'd have that two to three week kind of intense developing country experience too, where it's really all about, you know, being a little uncomfortable where you're at, you know, what you're doing. Jim, I yeah. want to, I want to thank you uh, very much for this very thought provoking presentation. And uh, in the interest of time, I, I have plenty more questions that have come my way, but I'm, I'm looking at, you know, folks, they probably have other meetings and such uh, gone beyond the allocated time. So let me hand it over to uh, Don. But before I do that, uh, I want to thank you myself for taking on this invitation and, and really appreciate your making this presentation. Uh, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to catch up with some familiar names and faces here I haven't seen for many years, so it's great. Don, over to you. Thank you, Mark. And. Um, Yes, I hope the audience doesn't mind we overran by a few minutes here. Um, so much comments and appreciation in the chat that I, that I think it was it was good to do that. Jim, it's been a pleasure to hear your insights on this topic of collaboration between uh, research and industry. I'm impressed by your own work in this area, very much walking the talk, as, as we might say, looks pretty class leading to me what you've what you've achieved there. So my, my congratulations on that front and thank you for sharing your your thought. The, for those not familiar with CIB, we're, we're the global network for collaboration in research and innovation in, in our sector. And our members are all those actively engaged in research and innovation, whether it's as researchers or students or research funders and professional bodies. And I thought there were messages for all those parties there. And, and certainly this area of collaboration is very much one where we believe CIB can provide a, a role of strategic thought leadership around the world because of the strength of that network of, of, of our members. Um, with our messaging, our agenda really being focused on the value in every sense of that, of that collaboration, I thought you brought out a number of those points extremely well. So thank you um, very much indeed for that. I'm delighted to see your references to integrated design and construction, which is one of, has been one of our three priority themes for the last uh, three years. And also your emphasis on understanding the business and economic drivers, two of our most vibrant working commissions are those on construction industry economics 
and organization and management of construction. So, so you know, you really played to a number of the themes. Well, and our, our, our other priority theme is environmental sustainability, of course. And, and so you play to that subject as well. So all, all I can do is closing is, is thank you all for your time and express, uh, if I may, a formal vote of thanks on behalf of the CIB membership for the time you put in for preparation today and for the quality of your delivery. Jim Rowings, thank you very much. Thank you.